Hello and a warm welcome to our Conversations in Design session. I'm Claire German, Managing Director of the Design Centre Chelsea Harbour. In this exciting virtual format, we're keeping our community engaged and inspired by bringing together designers, industry insiders and media guests for some great conversations online. Books inspire, enthrall and enrich. And a sumptuous design book has the power to transport you away from everyday life into a fascinating world. Today is all about an extraordinary book published by Fiden called By Design, the world's best contemporary interior designers. Thoughtfully created, it demonstrates how interior designers continue to raise the bar of creative practice. And I'm delighted to introduce two of the book's contributors, Sarah Douglas, editor-in-chief for Wallpaper, and Kate Watson-Smythe, journalist, author and founder of Mad About the House. And who better to speak to them than Virginia McLeod, Fiden's Executive Commissioning Editor for Architecture and Design. Thank you all for tuning in and please enjoy. Thank you. Good afternoon and good evening to everyone joining us from around the world. I'm Virginia McLeod, Executive Commissioning Editor for Architecture and Design at Fiden, and I am delighted to welcome you to this virtual conversation for London Design Week 2021. Today we're here to celebrate by design, the world's best contemporary interior designers, which is Fiden's latest interior design survey, which showcases more than 100 of the world's most exceptional interior designers. By Design joins at the lineup of Fiden's groundbreaking series of art, architecture and design books, in which we ask the world's best thinkers to tell us who they think the best practitioners are. This time to help us uncover the best interior designers working today, we ask leading writers, editors, curators, stylists, photographers, and industry influencers to tell us who they thought were the best interior designers in the world. And I'm joined here by two of those esteemed contributing experts, Kate Watson Smythe, award-winning journalist, author, and founder of the UK's number one interiors blog, Mad About the House, and Sarah Douglas, editor-in-chief of Wallpaper, the world's number one global design destination, for a conversation on contemporary interior design around the world. Welcome, Kate and Sarah. It's really a huge pleasure to have you join us today. Okay, let's jump straight in. One of the things that we've been so delighted about in this book is the personal criteria that each nominator brought to their selections. One of the things I asked you both was to reveal to me one designer you nominated, one rising star you spotted, and one unexpected surprise that you found among the pages of the book. So if I can start with you, Kate, could you please tell me who you nominated and why? I, I've slightly cheated and picked up on two nominations I made for different reasons, but I love them both. And the first is Beata Hoyman, who is or could also fit into the rising star category. She's huge at the moment and everybody loves her style. It's fun, it's interesting. And it's a bit different from what we've seen recently. And I love the way she works. So we've got here a picture of a cafe she's done in London, but also some of her interiors. And Beata talks very much about being led by nostalgia when she designs. And I think that's a really great way to kick off a scheme. It's about, you know, for the, for the client, looking back to what made you happy or what you associate with growing up and bringing those elements into your design as an adult, because that means you will always feel comfortable there. And she's quite irreverent as well. She has fun um, in her design. So there's a sort of element of kitsch creeping in, but she will then bring in beautiful antique pieces to sort of level it off and bring a balance to it, which I think is really fun. In Not Pictured Here, her daughter's nursery has um, a mural she's drawn of martini drinking, cigar smoking rabbits. And, and that kind of sums up her design philosophy. It's, it's fun and I love it. Um, and my other nomination is Linda Boronke, who was the design director of Soho House for many years and has now left to do her own thing. And I think that's fascinating you know we're or many of us are familiar with Soho House and that beautiful sort of relaxed comfortable environment that that also manages to feel very individual and I'm, I'm fascinated to see what Linda will do next because one of the things that comes out of designing for commercial spaces is an element of practicality so you know it all has to work for for heavy hard use and that plays well 
into residential design as well but then look at that disco ball over the swimming pool I mean that's just completely fun and we should all I think design our homes with a mental image of a disco ball over a swimming pool and so that we're having fun with it because that I think is really important and an often underrated part of interior design. Absolutely fun is uh, you can't have too much of it especially the, the, in these days um, and Sarah could you please tell us who you nominated and why? Yeah, cool. So uh, one of my nominations was, was Pierre Ivanovich. Um, I absolutely love his work. I think he brings austerity and rigor, yet still has that kind of humor that's needed, like Kate was talking about, into his spaces. He has a lot, he does a lot of private residences. And um, I think the way he approaches each house and approaches each space is, is so sensitive. Um, and the way he deals with light, um, with the architecture, he's very sensitive to existing architecture. I first went to, the first space I went to of his um, was I was actually a plus one, it was an artist friend. And we went to his collector's house and I walked in and I was just completely in awe. Every, every detail, every intervention, every texture, every color just made me feel good. Um, and so I think that's why, partly why I, I nominated Pierre. Amazing. Um, I hope we get to go to these sorts of places again very soon. I, I would love to go to his hotel in the Alps. It looks absolutely stunning. Um, now we're going to turn to the rising stars of interior design. Kate, can you tell me about your choice for a rising star? I picked on Bridget Romanek uh, for my rising star. She opened her studio in 2018 and within six months was on the Architectural Di Digest 100 list of great designers. So she she sort of came out of nowhere it feels very quickly and her work is just wonderful and picking up on what Sarah said about Pierre she also her designs are characterized by really working with with what she's got and bringing that into the design and I think that's such a key part of it as well you know you can't necessarily impose your ideas onto a building that doesn't want them you know look at what you've got and and bring that into the interiors and I think we can see here with these examples of the paneling and the sort of rich leather chairs but also in the one before the sort of light crittle style internal windows so she she manages to be I think both kind of clean and minimal but also there's a lot going on, you know, there's a lot of detail and every piece in every room has a point, it has a reason to be there. And, and I really love that. But at the same time, they do feel like spaces that, that you could go in and sit down and be comfortable. And I think often that can be a case with a, with a lot of high-end interior design. You think you might be a bit frightened to go in and, you know, kick your shoes off and curl up on a chair and read a book. And I've certainly been drawn to designers with an element of what you might call livability, uh, to make up a word. Um, and I think the, her rooms have that. You know, I'd love to go into that library and just sit down in one of those comfy blue chairs and, and browse through the bookshelves. And I think that, for me, is, is what's drawn me to her design. And I'm fascinated to follow and see where she goes next. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, and Sarah, who have, you, who have you got your eye on for a rising star? Um, well, I've actually nominated uh, Teo Yang here from Korea. Uh, we first featured his work in Wallpaper in 2018. He designed a really, or, or he renovated a really beautiful wooden Hanuk house. Um, but the way he deals with tradition and um, the present coexisting in his spaces, I think is, is very, very accomplished. And I think he's gonna go very far. Thank you. And I think what they have in common with what Kate was talking about is a sensitivity to the architecture in which they're creating internal spaces. So you can see that in Victorian, Georgian, traditional Korean spaces as well, you see those kind of architectural details really brought to life and coming into play as sort of an integral part of the interior. So I really like that level of kind of care and attention. And I think I, work, I, I commissioned Teo uh, in 2019 after this project to actually do design something for what we were calling wallpaper handmade. Um, and I paired him with this Mallorcan tile manufacturer and he made these really beautiful bird baths 
you know, in this peach and white terrazzo. And I think he's very adapt adaptable to projects. And I think that's that's really, really crucial if you're if you're kind of making a name for yourself and trying to get your work seen. Absolutely. And he's kind of one of one of the um, people in the book who brings a real diversity of style and culture and background to, to the book, which is one of the things I love about it. And so last but not least from the pages of By Design, can I ask you both about the designers who surprised or delighted you? So if we can start with you, Kate. Well, I've cheated again here. <laughs> um, and <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I I mean, I just was sort of spent ages browsing through the book and I came up with three designers who um, one of whom I was familiar with, two of whom I was less familiar with. Um, and, and I like them all for different reasons. So the first one is Christina Celestino. Um, and we see here some of her designs. It talks in the book about the tram she did at Milan Saloni, which I'm going to, I feel like it was last year, but it was clearly then two years ago. Um, and I love her sort of rich designs and her mix of color and pattern. She's an absolute master for that. So it's, it's kind of full on and maximal, but it's absolutely not fussy. You know, there's, it's geometry. So there's the draped ceiling, but the bold stripes. So I'm gonna call it a sort of clean maximalism. And I love that idea that it's it's very elegant, but again, it's fun and it's bold and it's striking. And she did some of the shops in Milan. And I remember having a bit of downtime when I was there um, and just going around her shops, Red Valentino, and seeing what she'd done there, uh, which is a, another kind of different discipline, but also brings that same very Christina sense to it. So love seeing what she's doing and she's done some great work with tiles as well I think so that's one of mine who I always love to look at um and then I moved for totally different reasons to Red Cahoy based in New York City and again also dramatic but in a completely different way these are sort of own first look very traditional sort of classic spaces but there's always a twist to them if you look closely. So the walls, I think, in this are not painted, they're silk. And they've got a, a sculpture of a stag's head rather than the traditional stag's head. So there's that sort of theatrical opulence, but with a modern twist. And it's these are rooms I could look at for ages. You can lose yourself in all the details. There's a lot going on and it's a difficult look to pull off. But you know they have done it here and and it's beautiful I love these spaces and again I feel I could sit in there with a martini and you know copy it by design they don't <laughs> they don't feel sort of scarily perfect they feel welcoming so that's another great one which is a contrast I think to the Christina sort of cleaner maximal look and my final surprise is Tamsin Johnson. And I admit I didn't know about her and I just fell in love with these pages. Um, I think she was the daughter of an antiques dealer. So she uses vintage, she's got that in her DNA. And again, based on her local surroundings, she's in Australia. So it's very light and bright with that clean light. So she's used that sort of almost like a gallery to showcase these wonderful vintage pieces she picks up on. I mean, of course, we haven't all got beautiful arched windows and, and columns in our houses, but, you know, she she it's all about the sort of white background, the natural elements of the room. And, and each piece is a delight. You want to look and see, you know, how she's juxtaposed that kind of ornate twig lamp with that very classic rattan chair and just the work of art it's all beautifully curated against this very simple clean background um, which is not something I'm capable of and I love looking at it and again is a contrast completely to the other two which are more full-on I suppose you could say so all of those were 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 a delight for me. Me too those are a lovely selection of three and lots of contrast and it's interesting in the book how geography and location are evident in the interiors, not always because there's sort of international trends and things that are sort of going on that affect everyone working anyway. But Tamsin Johnson, for example, I think there's a breeziness and a lightness of touch that like really speak about Australian culture. Yeah. Which kind of leads me to um, Sarah and your surprise, the, the, the studio that surprised and delighted you. 
Yeah, I mean, so my delight in going through the, the studio in Mumbai, um, I met them in um, India in 2011. And I think what they were doing then and, and what they've managed to achieve in, since then, since the last 10 years, you know, this commitment to working with local craftsmen um, and at the same time being forward, bringing forward Indian craft to a, a completely global audience through the visibility in their work. Uh, and it's, it just, it really celebrates the skills and craft that India can offer. Uh, and it's just very, very relevant for now. And I, I, I think their work just kind of brings me happiness. Definitely, Be beautiful work, absolutely stunning. Um, I think the next question that I'm going to sort of put to you or that we can talk about actually leads from from that and from the sorts of studios that you were just talking about. It's kind of the, the idea of spirit or soul in interior design. I think it's fair to say that all designers are interested in creating spaces that are meaningful habitats for the lives of others. So however it ends up looking, whatever the style it is, I think every designer would claim that as their ambition. So space is what we might call having spirit or soul. It's a strong thread that runs throughout the book. So I was wondering what do you think is important to consider when creating meaningful spaces, whether it be for yourself or for a client or for those of us who aren't designers recognizing it in the work of others. Kate, have you got any thoughts about spirit and soul in interior design? I think that would come back in a way to why I picked Beata as one of my choices. It's that sense of, you know, it's your home, it should tell your story. And of course, all designers try and do that. And but some, I think, do it with a greater or, or, or less a sense of, of success. It's about, you know, making it feel it, it's got to look like a home, you know, and you want to feel that that there are real people living in there, not just people who thrown a lot of money at something and and sort of are living with the results and I think sometimes not at all in this book but we we all see many more interiors now you know one of the things that that social media has done for us is to allow us to see into many more homes and design studios than we could ever do before um, you know before that we had to it was magazines or, or we had to visit them um, so we're much more familiar with with you know, how other people live. And I think we see a lot of rooms which have just been decorated as a perhaps a series of box ticking or following trends. And, and there's no sense of a real human behind them. And I think what we've got through this book is that sense of, you know, real people and individuality and, and character. Um, and those, I think, are the, are the great sense of design that you feel you can either walk into the room you know virtually by by looking at these pages and feel that you get a sense of the kind of people that might live there and that's absolutely important and I think what all these designers in this book have managed to pull off whether it's commercial spaces or or residential it's true in in some way and I can't quite put my finger on it or put words to it but I think you can sort of spot it uh, in the pages and, and when you look in magazines and when you visit places, it's like, I want to inhabit this space. I want to have a martini here or move in and live my life or whatever it might be. Sarah, is there anything you can kind of put your finger on as to what, how to identify that, what it takes to create that? Yeah, I think that, I think there is a common thread and that's something that I think we're all really, really um, aware of, which is designed to last. You know, producing spaces, designing spaces, designing objects that, that last and don't end up in landfill after a year. So using local local woods from local forests, local materials, local artisans, and creating things that, and you can sense it when you see the pieces, even in photographs, you can sense that it's design that's, that's had a lot of love and energy as well as thought about where that materials come from um, and how th the space will be used. Definitely, and I also think that it's really impressive when designers work with their clients to incorporate bits and bobs they've picked up on their travels around the world that don't necessarily go together, but they create a sort of an environment in which they have space to live and breathe on their own or people's art collections or other possessions or even the lives of children as opposed to adults and how that all gets incorporated into a fantastic environment for living I think it's it's so clever and and so important for like living a
peaceful, meaningful life. So I'm in awe of what great interior designers can create. So another aspect that I think is, um, has been a regular comment from the nominators um, who selected designers for the book is a consideration of a designer's environmental and sustainability credentials. So can I ask you, what do you think are the most important environmental criteria for designers to consider? Kate. Oh, you're starting with me again. <laughs> yeah, I, I figured um, I'd keep it going in-, in, uh, in Keep it going on it, right. Um, <laughs> Well, and this is absolutely true, and I notice uh, that that many designers again and again are coming back to sustainability. And one of the things that that I wanted to bring in to this is that not necessarily, you know, and I think we've touched on this elsewhere, or you were going to, is not everybody can afford an interior designer. So, in terms of talking to to people who are doing their own homes and their own spaces. Um, and, and haven't got huge budgets. Obviously, we are much more aware of the sustainable question now. You know, fashion's had its moment. It's coming into interiors. There is now a realisation of the sheer amount of, of waste and trend. You know, I was talking to someone who installed kitchen worktops recently, and he said he had a client uh, somewhere in North London, which could remain nameless, who were changing their kitchen worktop every year just because they could and they were bored and it was it was a horrifying moment um to to hear that that kind of thing was was still happening and i'm sure it is so one of the things i think is yes we would love to all use organic cotton or hand woven silk or or hand painted wallpaper and that speaks of course to craftsmanship and and artisanal work but it is more expensive and not everybody can do it. So I think the very important thing is to come at it from the other side and which is achievable to everybody. And that's to think about your waste. So whether you're doing your own home, you can repurpose or reuse, you know, repaint something or cut it down to a different shape. Or again, for high-end designers, how do you get rid of all that leftover stuff? Um, and I met recently uh, Jules Haynes from the Haynes Collection, and she has set up a business where she goes to designers and says, give me or sell me your waste fabric. I don't care if it's one metre, it might be 10 metres. I can sell it on and either give money to charities or we can work together to dispose of it. And her stated aim is that she wants to make it easier for you to get rid of your waste than it would be to put it in the bin. Um, and that is something that I, I think we can all get involved in that because it doesn't cost us money. So Jules will take lamps, she'll take small pieces of material, um, she's looking at taking tiles, but for all of us, we can get really involved in how we dispose of things if we, if we feel the need to replace them. And of course, the other really sustainable thing for me, which is really important, is, is using vintage. You know, it can be, I think technically antique is 100 years, isn't it? And vintage is anything over 20. But basically, have you got something old? You know, have you, you know, because that again speaks to the personality of a place if it's, you know, historic or you've inherited it. But, you know, you don't have to have your granny's beautiful old chair. You could have someone else's granny's beautiful old chair from eBay, but, you know, and reupholster it in a fabric that speaks to you. So it's those for me are the sort of key manageable ways that we can all be sustainable without having to have a squillion pound budget. Exactly. And we've got an, uh, a designer in the book called Retrievious based in London, who this is their specialty. They I have lots of their pieces. Yes. Yeah. yeah <laughs> wonderful. So I, I, I agree. I think that's a really um, creative and kind of aesthetically meaningful way to um, re reduce waste and so on. And, and Sarah, have you got any thoughts on, uh, on, on this subject? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Kate, and I think it, it comes down to a mindset that that we that we all are getting into, and, and, that, and it doesn't mean that you necessarily do, do have to spend ten thousand pounds on a sofa. Uh, you can actually get really wonderful designs, uh, secondhand vintage, um, and it's about just being aware. I think being aware of materials, aware of how many things you have. I mean, I hope those kitchen workshops went to someone else. <laughs> They probably didn't though, did they? That's the tragedy. Let's all pretend they did, but I'm pretty sure they didn't. 
I'm actually working on a project at the moment with Vitra and Glasgow School of Art, where the, the, the Glasgow School of Art students are repurposing um, old Vitra furniture. And, and I think it, it, it's a really important message that, that we can work with existing material. Oh, that's really, really interesting. However, <laughs> however, I think that we're now run, running out of time and my cat is telling me that uh, all that's left to say is Kate and Sarah, thank you both so much for joining us today to celebrate by design during London Design Week and for sharing all your valuable insights. It's been a joy to work with you on this very special project. Thank you too to everyone who's tuned in from around the world. By Design will be available worldwide from the 26th of May, and you can purchase your copy from Potterton Books at the Design Centre or order online at fiden.com by design. Thank you very much.